In the deepest parts of human thought, there is an old question that keeps coming up. Do people really have free will? For thousands of years, this question has been bothering thinkers, priests, and scientists like a lingering cloud. Imagine a young shepherd who is looking up at the stars and wondering if what he is doing is his own free will, or if it is planned by cosmic forces. We are interested in the history of the idea of free will, which takes us through the hard landscapes of ancient societies and philosophical thought. The roots of this argument can be found in ancient Greece. Philosophers argued about what it means for people to be autonomous in Athens' busy agora. People were worried about how much freedom people really had because of Socrates' deep questions. Plato, who was his student, thought of a world full of shapes, which suggests that what people do might be shadows of a bigger truth. But Aristotle was the first person to spark the idea by arguing for logical action. His statement that people, not animals, can think and make choices opened the door for further conversation. But the idea of free will wasn't just found in the Mediterranean. Some old Indian texts, like the Bhagavad Gita, raised important questions about fate, duty, and choice. The warrior Prince Arjuna was stuck on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. He didn't know what to do or what not to do. He was torn between duty and desire. Krishna, his charioteer, told him how important it was to have free will and how important it was to be free inside. As time went on, the Roman Empire grew, carrying the intellectual flame of Greece. Epictetus, Seneca, and other Stoics thought a lot about how fate and free will work together. They taught us that even though we couldn't change the things that happened around us, we could change how we reacted to them. This Stoic persistence, which pushed for inner freedom, even when there were limits on the outside, was a theme that ran through Western thought. Muslims in the Middle East also thought about this age-old problem. With its intricate web of words, the Quran strikes a careful balance between the all-powerful God and free will. Theologians like Al-Ghazali and Ibn Rushd of Eros tried to find a way to balance God's plan with people's rights. This debate had an impact on both Christian and Jewish thought. So, the idea of free will has led to intellectual and spiritual study everywhere from the busy streets of Athens to the quiet banks of the Ganges. With its own unique cultural and spiritual views, each society has added to this ongoing conversation. As we move toward modernity, the question still stands. Are we writing our own fates, or are we just acting out a story that has already been written? We will look at this idea's past and how it is used in science, faith, and everyday life in the next few chapters. But first, Let's take a moment to think. When we make a choice, is it really ours, or are we just following the lead of an unseen conductor? When the Christian era began, it brought new ideas to the conversation about free will. In the early days of Christianity, philosophers had a hard time figuring out how to balance God's power with people's rights. Augustine of Hippo was in the middle of this religious tug of war and his deep insights would have a lasting effect on the way people in the West think for many years to come. Augustine used to be a selfish pleasure seeker, but he had a deep change that brought him to the center of Christian thought. His books, like Confessions and The City of God, look at how divine grace and free will work together in complicated ways. Despite the fact that God's kindness was needed for forgiveness, Augustine said that people could choose between sin and goodness. This careful balance made him even more sure that divine knowledge and human freedom could live together. But Augustine's ideas were not always agreed upon. The Pelagian error, named after the British monk Pelagius, disagreed with his ideas by saying that people can naturally be saved by their own efforts without needing God's help. This caused a heated debate in theology, with Augustine strongly supporting the importance of grace. In the end, Pelagianism was declared heresy. Along the Mediterranean, Islamic scholars were having the same kinds of arguments. A well-known school of thought called the Mutazilites believed that people had free will and that being morally responsible meant being able to choose between right and wrong. The Asherites, who were against them, came up with the idea of divine fate, 
which said that everything happened because of God's will, even what people did. This philosophical debate showed how Christians talk about things and how people all over the world are trying to figure out how divine authority and human free will work together. Scholastic thinkers in medieval Europe tried to find a balance between faith and reason, drawing heavily on Aristotle's ideas. Thomas Aquinas, who was a huge figure at this time, had a complicated view of free will. In Summa Theologica, Aquinas's most important work, he said that people have free will because they are rational, but that this freedom works within the limits of divine justice. By combining Aristotelian ideas with Christian teaching, Aquinas made it possible for more academic and religious research into free will. The Reformation started a new debate at the same time as the Renaissance. Martin Luther, who started Protestantism, stressed the idea of sola fide, which means faith alone. This was different from how the Catholic Church saw salvation and free will. Luther's writings, especially on the bondage of the will, said that the will is bound to sin and that only God's love can free it. John Calvin, who lived at the same time, added to these ideas and argued for the idea of destiny, which says that God has already decided what will happen to each person. These religious questions, which were full of both scholarly seriousness and spiritual passion, have left an indelible mark on the history of free will. The connection between God's power and human freedom is still a big topic in religious debate. It has an effect on not only Christian thought, but also the wider web of world religions. As we move into the modern era, the question of free will opens up new lines of study in both philosophy and science. As we learn more about philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology, the age-old debate about fate and free will takes on new forms. However, before we go any further, let us think about this. How do the threads of divine will and human freedom fit together in the grand plan of things? During the Enlightenment, faith was thrown out the window in favor of reason and scientific research. This was the start of a new era of intellectual discovery. The idea of free will, which has usually been talked about in religious contexts, has all of a sudden become the main topic of academic debate. Thinkers all over Europe argued about what liberty really means and tried to find a way to balance it with the growing knowledge of a fixed universe. René Descartes, who is known as the father of modern philosophy, changed the way people thought about free will. Descartes famously wrote in his most important work, Meditations on First Philosophy, Cogito, Ergo Sum, I Think, Therefore I Am. This statement of self-awareness became the basis of his ideas. Descartes said that people had two natures, the res cogitans, which means thinking substance, and the res extensa, which means extended substance. This idea of dualism said that the mind, which could make decisions and use logic, was separate from the real world, which was governed by fixed laws. Later thinkers, on the other hand, disagreed with Descartes' duality. Baruch Spinoza, who lived at the same time as Descartes, had a very different point of view. Ethics, Spinoza's most important work, asserts that a complex web of causes and effects controls everything in the universe, including human behavior. Spinoza thought that free will was an illusion caused by people's lack of knowledge. He thought that real freedom came from understanding and following nature's natural order. During the Enlightenment, thinkers like John Locke and David Hume pushed the idea of empiricism to the forefront. Locke wrote Essay Concerning Human Understanding, in which he compared the mind to a tabula rasa, or blank slate, that is shaped by what it senses. Locke agreed that people do have free will, but he also said that our choices are affected by both outside forces and our own natural traits. Hume, on the other hand, was skeptical about the subject. In Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, Hume wrote that what we think of as free will is actually the result of mental training and habit. Immanuel Kant, a great thinker from the Enlightenment, did a great job of bringing these different points of view together. In Critique of Pure Reason, Kant made a distinction between the phenomenal world where senses work and the noumenal world. He said that in the noumenal domain, we have free will, 
even though our actions may seem planned in the visible world. Kant thought that moral duty needed free will because it gave us the ability to think about right and wrong and be independent. As the age of enlightenment gave way to the age of romance, conversations about free will became more intellectual and thoughtful. Philosophers like Jean-Jacques Rousseau argued that people should be free to speak their minds and do what they want, and they were critical of the bounds that society and culture put on these things. The Social Contract, Rousseau's most important book, said that the highest level of freedom comes from living in a self-governing community. During the Enlightenment and Romantic times, people's ideas about free will came back to life. This led to modern research into human liberty. The tension between determinism and freedom, reason and emotion, continues to shape contemporary thought as we navigate the complexities of an increasingly interconnected and technologically advanced world. There is still conflict between fate and freedom, reason and feeling, in the way we think about how to deal with the problems of a world that is more connected and technologically advanced. The tension between determinism and freedom, reason and emotion, continues to shape contemporary thought as we navigate the complexities of an increasingly interconnected and technologically advanced world. Think about this question. How can we balance our desire for independence with the knowledge that outside forces can affect our choices in a time of scientific progress and existential uncertainty. We had a very different view of the universe and our place in it when the science movement began. Newtonian physics view of the world as mechanical gained popularity, while the idea of free choice ran into new problems. Because physical rules seemed to be set in stone, it seemed like people didn't have much freedom. This led scientists and thinkers to rethink the idea of free will in light of new scientific knowledge. The ideas of Isaac Newton about motion and universal gravity made it possible to see the world as a huge, well-designed machine. Everything in this clockwork universe, from the movements of celestial bodies to the actions of particles, was planned ahead of time by causes that happened in the past. This fixed point of view is revolutionary in how it explains things but it makes me very worried about what freedom really means. Where did free will fit in if the universe was a machine? Philosophers like Pierre-Simon Laplace believed in this fixed view and said that if you knew the exact location and speed of every particle in the universe, you could accurately predict everything that would happen in the future. This point of view, called Laplacian determinism, said that free will was just a trick of our limited knowledge. Laplace says that the reason we think we are free is because we don't know why we do the things we do. But the science revolution brought about new ideas that were at odds with the fixed view of the world. When quantum physics was discovered in the early 1900s, it showed that the universe was much more difficult and uncertain than people had thought. Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg were among the first physicists to talk about indeterminacy at the subatomic level. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle said that you couldn't know exactly where a particle was and how fast it was moving at the same time. This meant that there was an element of randomness in the very structure of reality. This quantum uncertainty led to new ways of thinking about free will. If particle behavior wasn't fully set in stone, then it stands to reason that human actions affected by these particles weren't completely set in stone either. A famous quote from physicist and philosopher Sir Arthur Eddington said, The universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. This fresh uncertainty sparked an old argument and suggested that free will could exist in the probabilistic world of quantum mechanics. During the scientific revolution, biology and neuroscience also made progress, which made the fight over free will more difficult. The theory of natural selection developed by Charles Darwin was a scientific way to explain how life began. It emphasized how important genetic and external factors are in shaping behavior. This biological view suggested that traits passed down through families and strategies for adapting could affect how people act, which made people wonder how much control we really have. Because neuroscience focuses on the brain and how it works, it has given us more information about how people make decisions. 
Neural activity and brain function studies have shown that many of the choices we make are affected by our mind and neural networks. In the 1980s, Benjamin Libet did famous studies that showed brain activity related to making decisions happens before a person is aware of the choice. These studies caused a heated debate about the nature of free will. Can we really say we have free will if our brains start doing things before we are aware of them? Even with these science problems, people are still trying to figure out what free will is. We are still learning about how determinism and indeterminism, nature and culture, and conscious and unconscious processes work together to shape our ideas about freedom. At this point where science and philosophy meet, the question still stands. How is there room for free will in a universe ruled by physical laws and biological imperatives? As we learn more about the complexity of human understanding, psychology gives us new ideas about what free choice means. With all of its thoughts, feelings, and wants, the mind is both a battlefield and a safe place for people who are fighting for liberty. From the start of psychoanalysis to the present day, Cognitive neuroscience is part of the field of psychology that tries to figure out how people make choices and understand their free will. Psychoanalysis was created by Sigmund Freud, who gave us a new way to think about the mind. Freud thought that the mind is made up of three parts, the ID, the ego, and the superego. He said that most of our behavior is caused by our inner wants and conflicts. There are three parts of our mind, the ID, which has basic drives, the superego, which has moral limits, and the ego, which connects the two and affects how we act. People have argued about how much control we have over our actions because Freud focused so much on the inner mind. How much freedom will we really have if hidden forces affect how we act? Carl Jung built on Freud's ideas about the unconscious by coming up with the ideas of symbols and the collective unconscious. Jung's study of the inner self, which is made up of the parts of our minds that we try to hide, made the question about free will more difficult. Jung thought that individuation, or bringing these shadow selves into our aware selves, was very important for human development and freedom. This journey of self-discovery and merging showed me how important it is to understand and accept the complicated parts of myself in order to be truly free. There were people like B.F. Skinner, who led the behaviorist movement. Skinner did things in a different way. Behaviorism puts more weight on what can be seen and the outside factors that affect it, while thinking about how people think and feel inside is less important. Skinner's theory of operant conditioning says that actions are controlled by their results and that rewards and punishments determine what people will do next. From this predetermined point of view, free will was just a fantasy caused by our training. Skinner thinks that if we learn how to change people's behavior, we will be able to predict and control their actions, which goes against the idea of liberty as we know it today. People like Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow pushed humanistic psychology, which emphasized the chance for personal improvement and self-actualization. Maslow's order of needs and Rogers' client-centered care both stressed how important it is to know yourself take responsibility for your actions, and set worthwhile goals. Humanistic scientists said that people have an innate ability to make choices and move forward, even though unconscious and environmental factors affect how we act. This point of view showed free will in a more positive light, focusing on the chance for personal growth and happiness. Cognitive psychology and neuroscience have helped us understand how people make better decisions. Cognitive biases, patterns, and the executive functions of the brain have been studied to show how complicated human thought is and how different factors affect our choices. The work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky on cognitive errors, like the availability heuristic and the frame effect, shows that our decisions are often affected by mental shortcuts and subconscious thoughts. These results called into question the idea of logical decision-making which suggests that free will works within a system of cognitive boundaries and errors. A neuroscientific study on the neural aspects of decision-making has given us new information about how the brain affects our decisions. Functional magnetic resonance, 
Imaging fMRI and other types of neuroscience have shown the intricate networks that affect moral thinking, planning, and impulse control. These results show how brain processes, conscious thought, and external inputs combine, highlighting how complicated human agency is. No matter how much we learn about psychology, the idea of free will remains a puzzling puzzle. With all of its effects and boundaries, the mind is both a task and a tribute to how strong people are. As we continue our search, think about this question. Where does the core of free will live in the deepest parts of our minds, where thoughts, feelings, and wants interact with each other? Being an existentialist means that the idea of free will is deeply emotional and rational. Existentialism is a movement that started in the 1800s and 1900s. It focuses on how free, responsible, and free a person feels in a world that is often uncaring or silly. An important part of existentialism theory is the belief that people are born free, which gives them power, but also makes their choices very important. Soren Kierkegaard, who is known as the father of existentialists, wrote about the idea of personal freedom and the need for faith to live a true life. Kierkegaard's study of unease, which is sometimes called the dizziness of freedom, brought to light the philosophical question of what to do. As Kierkegaard saw it, being aware of your freedom and the endless options, it gives you can be both exciting and crippling. His works, such as Fear and Trembling and The Sickness Unto Death, show how important it is to accept one's freedom and make real choices, even when there is risk and doubt. Friedrich Nietzsche, a major figure in existentialist thought, reportedly said that God had died and that people now had the freedom to choose. Nietzsche's writings pushed the idea of the Übermenscher, which means a person who goes beyond standard morals and makes up their own. Nietzsche thought that having free will meant rethinking all values deeply and having the guts to live in a creative and honest way. His idea of will to power shows how existentialists stress the importance of human choice and the need to force one's will on a world that doesn't seem to care about it. Jean-Paul Sartre, a famous existentialism figure of the 20th century, added to the ideas of freedom and responsibility. Sartre wrote the important book Being and Nothingness, in which he said that existence comes before essence. This means that people are not born with a set character, but must create their own essence through their actions. The famous saying by Sartre, man is doomed to be free, shows the existentialist view that freedom is both a necessary condition and a big duty. Sartre thinks that the choices we make shape who we are, and that the responsibility that comes with freedom often leads to existential anxiety or bad faith which is turning down one's freedom and duty. A famous existentialist and feminist philosopher, Simone de Beauvoir, wrote more about these ideas, especially when it comes to gender and oppression. In her groundbreaking work, The Second Sex, de Beauvoir looked into how societal institutions and cultural norms limit women's independence. She argued that gaining full autonomy required not only human agency, but also the removal of repressive structures that limit individual choice. De Beauvoir's existentialist feminism stresses the connection between personal freedom and social context, stressing the importance of collective liberty in the quest for individual autonomy. Albert Camus, another famous existentialist thinker, studied the idea of absurdity and what it means for human freedom. In The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus wrote that people are in a never-ending battle against an uncaring universe, and the ludicrous hero, Sisyphus, accepts that his efforts are pointless but finds meaning in the fight. Camus thinks that recognizing absurdity leads to a rebellious affirmation of life and freedom, an acceptance of the present moment even though it lacks fundamental meaning or purpose. Existentialism, which stresses personal freedom, responsibility, and authenticity, is a good way to understand how complex human agency is. The existentialist path is full of uncertainty and existential distress, but in the end, it proves how strong the human spirit is and how important our choices are. Think about the philosophical point of view. How can we find our way through the maze of freedom and duty to live a true and meaningful life in a universe that doesn't care about us?
Today's world is challenging and interpreting the idea of free will in new ways. New discoveries in science, technology, and philosophy are changing how we think about human autonomy, raising fundamental questions about what freedom means in a world that is becoming more complex and interconnected. As we work through the modern problem, we need to think about how these changes affect our sense of self and agency. Neuroscience is one of the biggest problems with free will today. Brain function and decision-making research shows that a lot of what we do is influenced by our subconscious neural activity. For example, Benjamin Libet's experiments have shown that the brain activity that makes decisions happens before we are fully aware of our decisions. This has made some scientists and philosophers wonder if free will is just an illusion, a result of neurological processes that are outside of our conscious control. Some neuroscientists argue for a more complex understanding of free choice. They say that even though our subconscious may affect our decisions, conscious thought and self-control are still important in shaping our actions. This view emphasizes the interaction between automated and regulated systems which highlights how complicated human activity is. The challenge is to connect these findings with how we personally feel when we make choices and are in charge of our actions. The rise of AI and machine learning brings up new questions about free will and autonomy. As AI systems get smarter and can do things that humans used to have to do, we need to think about the moral implications of these new technologies. For example, the idea that AI could change people's behavior by using algorithms to shape their choices and preferences makes people worry about losing their independence. How can we keep our sense of free will in a world where data-driven algorithms can predict and change our actions? The philosophical debate about free will is still developing. Some philosophers, like Daniel Dennett, say that free will is compatible with a deterministic universe. They say that what defines free will is the ability for logical deliberation and self-control, not the lack of cause. This means that even in a deterministic world, our actions may still be seen as having free will if they are in line with our beliefs and goals. On the other hand, libertarians like Robert Kane say that real free will requires uncertainty. They say that true freedom means being able to make choices that aren't affected by what happened in the past. This point of view stresses how important randomness and unpredictability are in decision-making, which means that free will can't exist in a universe where everything is predetermined. The modern problem of free will is linked to bigger social and moral issues. The way that socioeconomic constraints, cultural norms, and institutional differences affect people's choices makes people wonder how much control they really have over their lives. How do we balance personal responsibility with knowing that outside factors limit our options and choices? This moral aspect makes it even more important to have a complete understanding of free will that considers how choices affect people's social situations. The question of free will is as important and difficult now as it was in the past. Neuroscience, technology, philosophy, and ethics all interact to create a complex web of points of view that adds to our understanding of human freedom. As we continue to explore this complex area, we should ask ourselves, how can we find a balance between autonomy and influence, freedom and determinism, in a society that is affected by science and technology? The idea of free will is important in many areas of our lives, not just philosophy and science. How we feel about autonomy and agency affects our experiences choices, sense of duty, and morality. As we go through the complicated parts of daily life, the idea of free will becomes both personal and useful. We make choices every day, from small ones like what to eat for breakfast to big ones like where to work and who to date. These choices are based on our sense of agency or the belief that we have control over our actions. This feeling of control is important for our mental health as well as our moral and ethical frameworks. When we believe we have the power to choose, we feel responsible for our actions and the results. The psychological concept of locus of control shows how important it is to believe in your own power. People with an internal locus of control believe that their actions can change the outcomes of their lives, 
while people with an external locus of control believe that outcomes are due to fate or chance. Research has shown that having an internal locus of control is linked to higher levels of psychological well-being, resilience, and proactive behavior. This shows how important it is to believe in our own power, even when outside forces seem to be blocking us. Our ideas about freedom will also affect how we interact with others and form relationships. To hold someone morally responsible for their actions, we must believe in their autonomy. When someone hurts us, we assume they had the choice to behave differently and must therefore take responsibility for their actions. This idea of moral accountability is at the heart of our political and legal systems, which are based on the idea that people are free agents who can make choices and deal with the results. But recognizing outside influences on behavior makes our sense of moral responsibility less clear. Our upbringing, socioeconomic background, mental health, and the environment all have a big impact on the choices we make. A more nuanced view of free will takes these influences into account while highlighting the importance of individual choice. This balance is necessary for building empathy and understanding in our relationships with others. Free will is an important part of human development because it helps us set goals and stay motivated. When we see ourselves as change agents, we are more likely to set high goals and keep going even when things get hard. Albert Bandura, a psychologist, came up with the idea of self-efficacy, which means believing in our own power to get what we want. This belief in our power drives our efforts and resilience, which leads to personal growth and success. There is also a connection between free will and determinism in the choices we make about our health and well-being. How we feel about autonomy and control affects the things we do, like what we eat, how much exercise we get, and how we deal with stress. A deterministic mindset can make us feel hopeless about making healthy choices, while trusting free will might encourage us to take action to improve our health and well-being. Our views on autonomy will have a big impact on our daily lives, from the choices we make to the moral judgments we make, because our sense of freedom affects everything from our experiences to our interactions. Having a more complex view of free will, one that takes into account both human agency and environmental circumstances, can help our mental health, promote empathy, and speed up our personal progress. Think about how our ideas about freedom will affect the things we do, the people we love, and how we feel about ourselves in daily life. How can we find a balance between freedom and influence so that our lives are full and meaningful? We don't know what the future holds, so the idea of free will is always changing as science, technology, and philosophy make progress. The challenges and opportunities of today's world make us rethink our ideas about autonomy and agency as we navigate the complicated terrain that is always changing. The rise of artificial intelligence and its possible effect on human autonomy is one of the most important developments in recent years. AI systems are slowly being used in many areas of our lives, such as healthcare, banking, social media, and entertainment. These technologies have many benefits, but they also make people worry about the loss of human agency. As algorithms shape our tastes and decisions, we need to think about the ethical implications of AI's effect on human autonomy. How can we make sure that new technologies support, rather than destroy, our sense of free will? Neuroscience keeps making progress, giving us more information about how the brain works. New research into brain-computer interfaces BSIS and neurotechnology could change what we know about the mind and what it can do. These technologies, which let the brain directly communicate with outside devices, could cure neurological diseases and make people smarter. But they also raise ethical concerns about the limits of human freedom and the chance of controlling or manipulating people. As we look into the possibilities of neurotechnology, we need to think about how it might affect our sense of self and autonomy. Philosophers are still arguing about free will, and new ideas are coming up that challenge old binary choices. Some philosophers want to take a more integrative approach, focusing on how deterministic and indeterministic factors affect non-human decision-making. 
Others are looking into the idea of neuroexistentialism, which explores how neuroscience affects existential problems like freedom, meaning, and identity. These philosophical questions continue to help us understand free will better by giving us a lot of different perspectives on what it means to be human. As we talk about ethics and social justice, the idea of free will is linked to bigger issues like fairness, accountability, and structural inequality. We need to think about how these issues affect people's autonomy and how they are affected by external factors that limit free will. This calls for a more humane and fair approach to moral judgment and social policy. How can we create a society that lets people be themselves while also recognizing the importance of social and environmental factors? Self-awareness and mindfulness are important for the future of free choice. Mindfulness, meditation, and contemplative inquiry are all practices that can help us understand our thoughts, feelings, and actions more deeply. By becoming more aware of our internal processes, we may be able to make better decisions and live more intentionally. These practices also let us explore the nature of free will through experience, emphasizing how important it is to be present and reflect on oneself when exercising autonomy. As we think about the future of free will, we should have a more complete and unified view of human agency. This view takes into account how conscious and subconscious processes interact, as well as the role of environmental factors and the freedom to choose for oneself. By facing these challenges with curiosity and compassion, we may be able to get a better sense of the depth of human freedom. As we come to the end of our trip, think about this question. How can we protect and improve our sense of free will in a society shaped by new technologies, scientific discoveries, and moral concerns? How can we navigate the future while valuing liberty, kindness, and living a purposeful life? Free will is still a deep and long-standing secret in the vastness of human thought and experience. As we move forward, may we continue to explore this mystery with wonder and wisdom, enjoying the beauty and complexity of our freedom to choose and be free.